uh, in the middle. Uh, Anne Segrist McCullough is president and CEO of Housing Partnership Equity Trust, a Washington, D.C.-based social purpose REIT that acquires and preserves affordable rental housing in partnership with leading nonprofit owner-operators. HPET, as it's known, owns nearly 3,000 units of rental housing in 15 properties across the country. Anne is also a longtime financial services executive and affordable housing advocate during her 18-year career at Fannie Mae. Anne held a wide range of key leadership roles, including Senior Vice President of Credit and Housing Access, with responsibility for expanding Fannie Mae's business in emerging multicultural markets and expanding consumer access to sustainable mortgage credit and affordable housing. She also held senior positions with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, the FDIC, and Resolution Trust Corporation. And is also vice chair of the board of the of governors of the National Housing Conference, where she's helped us um, uh, throughout the last few years, and especially in the last year that I've been here, and been incredibly helpful and a great partner. Um, Chris Siglin, at the end of our group here, um, is senior vice president for policy at the Housing Partnership Network, a collaborative of nearly 100 high-performing nonprofits that finance, develop, and manage affordable housing and community development projects throughout the nation. Before joining HPN, Chris was a vice president at Enterprise Community Partners, a longstanding uh, NHC member, a highly successful community development intermediary, and a syndicator of low-income housing tax credits. She also has 10 years of Capitol Hill experience, including serving as minority staff director of the Subcommittee on Consumer and Regulatory Affairs on the Senate Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs, working for two of my favorite members during her career um, on the Hill, Senator Kit Bond and Congressman Jim Leach. Um, Yana Miles, uh, on my immediate left, is the Senior Legislative Counsel at the Community for Responsible Lending, and she leads their advocacy on a variety of issues, uh, including mortgage finance, home ownership, and GSE reform. She's also served as a fellow with the Fair Housing Project of the Washington Lawyers Committee, where she worked on litigation involving discrimination in housing-related transactions and on the policy staff of the House Democratic Caucus. Dave Borsos. Uh, is Vice President for Capital Markets at the National Multifamily Housing Council, uh, where he has primary responsibility for managing and guiding NMHC's federal legislative and regulatory policies on housing finance reform, FHA, and financial market regulation. Dave has over 30 years' experience in real estate capital markets, banking, and sustainable energy markets. He spent 16 years at Freddie Mac in a variety of leadership roles within their capital markets group, focused on both single-family and multifamily markets. And so thank you all for joining us. Let's start with Anne. Um, it's been 10 years since Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were pl placed into conservatorship, and a lot has changed since then, both within the GSEs and in every aspect of housing regulatory arena as well. Uh, numerous attempts have been made to find a viable um, alternative to the GSE model, and none have been successful. What is necessary to break this gridlock and move our housing finance policy forward in a way that will protect the taxpayer from another bailout while ensuring Americans continue to have access to affordable and responsible mortgages? It's a big question. That is a big question. And honestly, I, I think Americans want three things in our housing finance system and in GSE reform, right? We want stability in our housing finance system. We want Fannie and Freddie to be able to deliver on their statutory purpose of supporting our primary mortgage markets. Uh, and that requires that they be safe and sound and well capitalized. The next is that people want fair, affordable mortgages that help people get ahead and don't put them at greater risk. And I think third is that we want the benefits of our housing finance system to be broadly shared across the country with families of modest means and in tougher to serve communities. And I believe we can get, we can accomplish those three things, but facts matter. And David, you used the word bailout. And so let's talk about that, right? I was looking just recently and Fannie and Freddie took down, have taken down 190 billion from the US Treasury and they've returned 286 billion in dividends without amortizing any of the principal on what they've taken down. I actually think that much money flowing back to the Treasury is a barrier to GSE reform. We are living off the money that Fannie and Freddie are taking out of the mortgage system and we're using it to balance our federal budget. 
That's a tough challenge for all of us, and we have to think about that. Uh, now, bailouts, uh, to be a little political, I mean, look at the TARP money that went out. Uh, ProPublica says that about $440 billion was paid out through TARP, and about $390 billion has been returned. So that is a gap, and some of that gap is coming through the money that we're getting from Fannie and Freddie. Okay, thank you. Um, Dave, how does rental housing fit into all this? In, in the multifamily arena, are we trying to fix a system that wasn't broken? And uh, what should we expect from uh, the GSEs in the multifamily market when, as the Federal Reserve recently reported, half of Americans are struggling to actually afford their rent? So as you point out, the multifamily market during the downturn performed exceedingly well. So the mantra that we always talk to both regulators and legislators, let's not try and fix something that's not broken, um, and what is the critical role? So one of the questions you ask about, you know, we've been at this for 10 years, and it kind of makes me think about the Star Wars entrance where you say, you know, in a galaxy long, long ago, you know, it, it, we've got this 10 years that we've been talking about this. We've been uh, batting it around, and Ann and I talked about it before. It's like, what else do you tell this group of people here who've heard a lot of this stuff for over the last 10 years? And, and we've been talking about a lot of the same things. The conundrums are still there. Every single time, something that seems like it's rational, uh, maybe rational, uh, just doesn't go anywhere because we get mired down and stuck in the muck uh, to try and get both sides of a party as well as an administration on board. So how does that impact multifamily? Um, one of the key things, I think, across the board, which um, I think is exceedingly important is, um, and, and some of the principles that Ann talks about are, are, are always there. You, uh, we feel it's very important to maintain some form of a government backstop. I think fundamentally a lot of the regulators and a lot of legislators are there. I think that's key in order to do that. We saw um, during the downturn where the GSE stepped in in a counter-cyclical role and, and filled a gap where other providers, not including FHA, because they also stepped in the gap there, um, disappeared from the market. And some of them have returned and others have not returned. So there's a, a critical ongoing role that we think that <clears throat> some form of housing finance reform plays um, as it pertains to multifamily and whatever we choose to do uh, coming out of that. Um, Additionally, you asked a question about how does it uh, fit in terms of the rental market where you've got a lot of challenges out there. If you look at um, outs, the dynamics in the market um, are such that development and where a lot of products been developed over the last 10 years um, has been much more towards the upper end, right? The reality is we have a very barbell distribution for development pipeline. So you've got upper end product and you've got what is a subsidized market. So whether it's a lie tech and you've got really almost nothing in between. And so um, what we really need to do is figure out solutions that uh, have the ability to develop uh, product and preserve and uh, product that serves all income brackets. And so I think that that is a challenge that the market faces from affordability, not only on the very uh, low end, but also in, in, in the middle income sector as well. So there are, there are uh, major gaps in terms of what as an industry we are, have the ability to deliver um, and meet some of those affordability challenges. Chris, um, nonprofit housing developers, they've really led the way in the production of affordable <laughs> housing, and yet there is so much more to do. And production is such a big piece of this. Uh, what needs to be preserved or enhanced uh, to ensure your members have all the resources they need? What else do we need to be doing? Well, I mean, it's just, it's really interesting, like, as my fellow panelists have said, to reflect on the fact that the GSEs have been in conservatorship for 10 years. I mean, children have grown up in that time. It's, it's kind of amazing. Um, but while, this, while it's not a shining moment for policymaking to not have any solution for 10 years. I think if you look at what's gone on in the past decade and the implementation of 
the Hera law that passed just before the GSEs went into conservatorship in 08, it seems like there are some pieces out there now that could be the basis for a thoughtful compromise if and when Congress eventually gets around to um, housing finance reform. And you know, I think that a lot of us have spent a lot of time recently on the Community Reinvestment Act and looking at the responsibilities on the primary market. And um, you know, the, the, Treasury, the Trump Treasury Department has come out with a report basically endorsing the idea that with rights come responsibilities with, in the primary market. And it, you know, it seems like that kind of conceptual frame also has been applied in various ways to the secondary market. And I think that there's a real, you know, looking at how, how duty to serve has been implemented with the notion that the secondary market agencies have obligations to both underserved pl people and geographies. You know, rural preservation, rural housing preservation, manufactured housing. That all, you know, it's due to serve has certainly not been perfect, but there's a lot of thoughtful work that's been done in how how the the secondary market can remain profitable, as Anne noted, how much money they've made, yet also serve urgent needs. You know, s similarly. Another thing that, had, that was included as part of the housing legislation that passed just before the GSEs went into conservatorship is an assessment on new mortgages bought by the Fannie and Freddie that funds the housing trust fund and the capital magnet fund. And the money is split 65% for the housing trust fund, 35% for the capital magnet fund. And the capital magnet fund is a pretty interesting, I think, new approach in housing policy that tries to take advantage of the highly productive nonprofit housing producers and community development financial institutions that lend on affordable housing. So the, there have been three rounds, and capital magnet fund is administered by the CDFI fund, and it, it is a competitive grant program where kind of best in class producers and lenders compete for the funds, and there have been three rounds. Um, they, they appropriated money for the Capital Magnet Fund in 2010, and then, then when the GSEs returned to profitability in 2016 and 17, there's been an assessment on their mortgage purchases that have funded um, th these Capital Magnet Fund grants. The, the statute requires them to be leveraged 10 to 1, they actually have been leveraged 20 to 1 in some of the rounds. And th they're really been used thoughtfully for things like um, gap filler, um, loan loss reserves. They figure the people who've gotten capital magnet fund grants have been very creative in figuring out how to um, make the money go farther and leverage other resources. So, you know, the there's 3.2 billion in leverage in the 2017 round, 2016 round of capital magnet fund. There's 2.2 billion in leverage. This seems like a really good model, and again, one of these things that people can agree on, and something that should be built on with housing finance reform. So we don't know what's going to happen. There will be a new conservator at FHFA next year, perhaps, and we don't know whether these assessments will continue or what will happen with that. But I should hope that. Um, as people sort of look at what's working with the secondary market and think about that, that frame of responsibilities and rights that that, that, that model is retained. Yeah, I think that's right. And it's, this is, we, it, it's easy to think about this as taxpayer money, but it is not taxpayer money. Yeah, it right. is funded from a user fee on primary uh, private market activity yeah. And um, it's uh, the only reason that it's being diverted from the taxpayer is because we haven't actually solved this problem yet. Um, the money, is, is, as Ann said. So, Yana, CRL has been such an important voice for responsible first-time home ownership and really in the vanguard against predatory lending practices. Um, some people have asserted that affordable housing created the housing crisis, despite this being debunked by countless studies. Um, and yet, credit remains tight. Home ownership is hovering at record lows. Minorities in particular have borne the brunt of the housing crisis. Um, what do we need to be doing to ensure that housing finance reform really benefits all Americans? So I, I just like to say these things out loud. I think you all know this already, but you know this this predatory borrower narrative um, has been a little bit more uh, popular than I like it to be. So I say these things out loud on any panel, even if I'm just preaching to the choir. Predatory lending and racial discrimination 
was the primary cause of the of the meltdown and I, we all know this but i just have to say it out loud just to just to be a, another person screaming into the void um so i want to make that point first um second you know i i I like the way Ann um, laid out her points for you know the housing finance system. One thing that we at CRL and many others in this room advocate for is a housing finance system that will serve all of the market at all times. And that means you know understanding that yes, it's it's very important to protect the taxpayer. That narrative to protect the system. We don't want another meltdown. But it's also mandated in the Housing and Economic Recovery Act of 2008, Hera, that. Uh, the GSEs have a duty, and it's in the GSEs' charters, they have a duty to balance that risk with reaching underserved communities. And that is something, um, you know, just to, just to point out for some folks that don't know, CRL is an offshoot of self-help, which is a CDFI. Self-help primarily lends to um, underserved families and underserved communities. And um, even in, I want to point this out really quick before getting, answering the question, even during the 2005-2008, the height of the foreclosure period, self-help's foreclosure rates were around 3%. Um, and I'm starting that with this to lead to my, to get to the, answering the question. I think it's a really um, important point. <laughs> <laughs> so you know we, we we live it. We're on a, we're not a, we're not a guarantor of an, a five trillion dollar system. Of course, we're a CDFI small lender, uh, our offshoot of that. But um, the, we've we've seen lower income p families with lower credit scores be able to have loans underwritten to their situation, sustain sustain lending and sustain and save home ownership. We've seen it. It's possible. And for in, in, in reference to something as huge as the next housing, housing finance system, Fannie and Freddie, or what comes after that, the right type of underwriting is not impossible. It's possible for the for the enterprises to protect their protect their finances, protect from another bailout. I think it is important that we remember that word. It, it's it is political, but it's a part of the discourse to protect against that and to fulfill a part of its mandate, which is to serve the entire market. That also includes allowing for, you know, on the other side, on the lender side, allowing small lenders to be able to continue to participate. I think in terms of, like, in the future, what's needed to, to serve the entire market, to reach credit-worthy families that don't meet pristine uh, credit uh, standards that, that exist right now is, sorry, I'm going to gather my thought for a second. So I, I talked about underwriting. Another piece that's important, small lenders. I'm blanking right now. That's okay. Another piece. Creditworthy families. <laughs> Creditworthy families. You. I thought it was me. <laughs> yeah. <no. laughs> um, well, all, all of these pieces are important. And the next, and I guess, okay, now I remember. Has anyone said don't throw the baby out with the bathwater yet? Is this like a bingo thing? Well, I'm going to, you can check that. You're going to be the though. first, but it may come up again. That, this is the point that I was blanking on. Um, there have been a lot of reforms and a lot of things that we've seen in the past 10 years, uh, beginning with the passage of Hera, continuing with the passage of Dodd-Frank, the Consumer Financial, Pro I still say Consumer Finan Financial Protection Bureau, and those pieces, um, those matter because they matter for a few reasons. One, they are tried and tested reforms. We all, I don't think anybody in this room believes that the housing finance system is okay as it is. We wouldn't be sitting here if we didn't. But one, the you know pilot programs that explore alternative credit that you've seen out of Fannie and Freddie, the um, additional kind of a FICO 9, you know, 10, 11, 12, these pieces that they're considering. These reforms, while they have issues and while we, some will argue they go too far, some I think I would argue they don't go far enough, they are a part of a narrative. And I believe that the next iteration of housing finance should build upon the reforms that have been made and improve upon the reforms that have been made, you know, improve upon affordable goals, improve upon the dirty, duty to serve rule rather than scrap it down and start from the beginning. So I think a, a critical piece for the next era, whatever what we're calling it, needs to really take into account the, the positive and needs improvement types of reform so that we can push forward and, and do a better job of serving the market while safely and sustainably being able to serve the entire market. So I think that was that's a, a pretty long way to get there, but. No, I think that's great. <laughs> and I think it's a really good point that to uh, kind of open this up to everybody is, we spend a lot of time at the Treasury Department internally and on the Hill in Johnson Crapo and, you know, uh, Corker Warner trying to reinvent the entire mortgage finance system. And it was a really intellectually interesting process. Um, but at the end of the day, I think where we found is that 
Um, this is like field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. And um, they're not coming. Um, the, even if you create you know, a new housing finance system with um, these de novo uh, organizations that will get a utility rate of return and have enormous political risk, no one's capitalizing that. I mean, there would be lobbyists lined up you know, the hall here and down all the halls of Congress. Who wants to put hundreds of billions of dollars into a utility rate of return? And every time I say that to somebody on Wall Street, they're like, you know, yeah, not me. And so if that's the case, then we may have the best system available to us, and we need to fix what we have. What do people think about that? Do we, do we need to tear it down and build it back up again? Or, in fact, um, are we already on the, pro on the road to fixing what's been broken? I'll just dive in first um, to say that I, I wanted to just also expand upon what I'm saying when I'm referring to some of these reforms. You know, for instance, yes, there are some issues with patching it up, but the qualified mortgage rule, the ability to repay standard, these types of reforms and that are now, you know, codified into law, they change the scope of what type of housing downturn we can expect. When we responded to mm -hmm. a lack of proper regulation and a lack of checking on, well, steering is still happening and redlining is still happening, but the way that it was happening so unchecked in the lead up to the financial crisis, the housing meltdown, we have to look at the next moment, you know, the counter cyclical role that we want FHA, Fannie and Freddie or whatever comes next to play think that we want to, you know, even if we are saying tear some things down, we want to keep, take into consideration that tra the trajectory of the next, you know, set of, of lending challenges that we're facing are going to be a little bit different than they were in 2005, 2006. So along those same lines, and you, uh, you mentioned this exercise, David, about the, I, you know, I've got this list at, uh, back at the office of all the various reform proposals that we've all looked at and gone through and what do they all look like and how different they are or not different. And, um, it, you know, time makes, I think, people forget. If you think about the, the, the time frame of 2010, 11, 12, people were like, oh, you got to, you know, destroy them. They were evil. And, you know, just to give you the, you know, one marker, and there's a hearing on it next week, the Henserling and Delaney, people who are now leaving the office. But the fact that Henseling has been this just hater of the GSEs to actually put out a proposal that in essence says, you know what, government guarantee, we're going to do that. And we're going to take a fee to pay for affordable housing. So you, you have a, what I think is a shift in some thought process along those lines. Do I think that that makes the legislative solution any easier? The answer is still probably no, which is why you hear administration talking about what are the administrative type of solutions and if you go down that path which in some ways FHFA uh, has been doing that has been doing some of the reforms they've been doing some of the things that people have wanted who have been you know enemies of and wanting to, to uh, wind down the GSEs is to say you know how do you protect taxpayers right CRT started and how do you do certain things where you do or don't want them to do certain things. So I think some of those reforms have already started to take place. And the question would be if the, admi the administration and the director of FHFA through here has an immense amount of latitude of what they, that person can do. And they can stop the treasury sweep. They could start to build capital. They can shrink the size of single family loans that they can purchase. They can put caps on multifamily if you want to try and promote private. So there's an immense number of things that can be done without involving legislation. And so I think the one thing that we all need to be aware of coming very soon in 2019 is the fact that Director Watt does roll off at the end of January 6th, right? So whoever steps in there, and, and the administration's been quoted as having interest. We are evaluating things as they talk about it. So I would fully expect that there's a much higher probability of something getting done administratively, and it's also going to depend on who they choose to put in there um, to move some things forward um, administratively and, and look for changes there. So if I were to that could be good, it could be bad. I mean, there, yeah. you know, there is some 
threat uh, to finance markets, both for the single family and the multifamily, I think, depending on what direction they choose to go. Well, and when we look at the list, um, you know, you've got the who's who of uh, candidates out there. You've got ideologues and engineers. Yeah. And uh, with a system this complicated, I'd kind of like to have an engineer rather than an ideologue. Anne, what do you think? Well, I'm afraid of unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. And do I love this system? Hell no. Who does? I'm still looking for the person who thinks, give me a good GSE system and entwine it into the American economy over 80 years and layer on every possible complication you can and say, yay, that's it. But in fact, it kind of is working. And we are making reforms. And if you try to cut this thing out and build the perfect system of the future, we won't just have people, <laughs> you won't have 10 years worth of age, you got 50 years worth of age. And if we pull it off, who knows what parts of the economy will cut off by mistake. So, I'm an engineer on this. I'm a fix what we can in deliberate and thoughtful ways. I would like to stop the sweep from going to the economy generally and into the budget generally if we're going to tax home ownership and rental housing through the dividend sweep. I would like it to go back into housing because mm -hmm. that's where the money's coming from. I'd like it to go back, but that's my that's my field of dreams moment, is taking that money and really supporting housing for folks who are not being helped today. Chris, you're a Hill veteran. Um, it's a little different world than when yeah. we served up there, but yeah. we also have divided government again. Is that better or worse? You know, I, I think Congress, I think it's been so difficult legislatively to do GSA reform partially because people tried to tear the whole system down and then it just, the fight became so complicated. I mean, I've, I, I've done a recent purge in my office and I had a stack of GSE stuff mm -hmm. that high because there have been all these, everybody's done reports, there were all these matrices comparing all these proposals and I think that task is just too hard for members of Congress, and, you know, the, for anyone. I, I, and so I think that really the best we can hope for is actually legislative endorsement of an administrative solution that builds on things that are working now. So, you know, duty serve, pretty good. The, the assessment and the funds, pretty good. Credit risk transfer, I mean, we've got to deal with this issue of uh, um, returning the money to the treasury, but and the need to build capital, but you can see that the pieces could be there, and then at some point in the future, Congress could just ratify it. Yep. I uh, want to steal a mm -hmm. point that you yeah. uh, made prior to this panel that I hadn't thought of, that I actually thought, wow, that took, so I'm going to steal it. This okay. was David's comment. You only have to credit me it. once. I'm going to say it, though, because um, I'm also a Hill veteran, and I think um, one positive, I agree with the uh, comment that it, it was a, like I came in at CRL at the time of Johnson Crapo, at right. the time where it was starting to hit its right. decline, and I thought, well, that was just a disaster, like from stop, like tar start to finish. It was, it just wasn't done well, well from my perspective in terms of how that was handled. And but I I agree with the point David made that it was an exercise that showed lawmakers how incredibly complicated the housing yeah. finance system is, and how regardless of what political outlooks we're looking at, this was the yes we can era, you know, that, and I'm not criticizing that era, but um, it was a time when I think there was a thought of let's be new, let's bring new ideas, we need change, mm -hmm. we're change everywhere, right? And I think that Congress learned a lesson, well, I think, I hope that they learned a lesson on how incredibly complicated restructuring it is and how incredibly yeah. complicated even building on top of what exists. And I, I think that a divided government uh, will not result in a, a law, right, right, that will get signed by the president or by this president, but I think that a dual chamber will help frame, frame like set, to, set up frameworks for a proposal that one day can have a bipartisan uh, coalition that supports it, because I think it has to be bipartisan no matter who's in charge, and, and proceed. Well, and the other good thing is that there's probably half a dozen members of Congress now who actually can use convexity in a sentence. <laughs> uh, let's take some questions from the audience. 
you have any questions? Okay. Yes. Priya? <coughs> BTC? Yes, but there was a, um, a group that was convening the Dallas PFD appointed yep. to now make a report to the commission. And it's all um, it's a little bit of a blur, but I do remember reading the report and thinking that the recommendations were sound. To a certain degree, they were modeled after Jenny May and a reinsurance model. Whatever happened to that? Um, it was, I think, um, Mel Martinez was on it, Henry Cisneros, Pam Patnow, now at HUD, um, was the staff person for it. Um, any chances of incorporating some of those ideas into the current system? So the the idea there, um, you know, and David mentioned before, you know, issuance model versus utility model, and so yeah. what what's the right type of solution? Um, the Delaney Henserling proposal actually utilized Ginny May. There have been a number of proposals floated out there to. Um, be, you know, have the government backstop guarantee uh, come through Ginny May um, and through a group of issuers. So whether it's, you can still call them Fannie or Freddie, it would still be entities similar to that, but multiple of those who would have the ability to issue securities and provide that first level of, of loss with the ultimate guarantee. Could that happen? The answer is, of course. Um, I think that replicating that. I mean, if you think about Ginny Mae and their guarantee program, they guarantee mortgages that are guaranteed by the federal government already, right? So people are all talking about then putting a model in place where you have private entities issuing securities and the private entities guaranteeing. So you have to first off change the charter for Ginny Mae to do that, and then you, you enter into a very different business model that Ginny Mae doesn't have any experience doing today. It doesn't mean that it can't be done, but to simply say we're going to replicate that um, adds in a significant layer of complication uh, and complexity to being able to move forward on that. It's, as Kristen said, it's just another one of the proposals out there uh, that people have analyzed and unfortunately um, has uh, challenges in implementing as well. Is the common securitization platform an interim step to that model or some kind of compromise? Well, that's just a, that is purely a securitization vehicle where you're simply trying to provide a common security platform to the existing enterprises and quote unquote any other type of entity that would securitize and issue a security that looks the same with the idea there, when you think about Freddie and Fannie today issue single family securities that are different, right? The delay, payment delays, et cetera, create muddiness in the water. And if you were simply saying, everybody's gonna issue the same type of mortgage-backed security, that doesn't translate into the, the guarantee side of it. It simply is the securitization vehicle. Yeah. But I don't think we're focusing enough on what powerful engines of access to economic opportunity the GSEs are. And so there's a lot of work that we're all doing on how to avoid the next crisis and how to make sure they're capitalized and how to address the difference in how a Freddie security trades versus a Fannie. All that's nice engineering, but most of us are in this room because we care about the opportunity that housing provides to working Americans. And anything we're gonna do with the GSEs really needs to focus on having them proactively support affordability, proactively support primary market players who are doing innovations, who are looking at different ways to serve the market and helping them scale those innovations so you can lower costs and really deliver benefits more broadly. It's not just enough to make them super safe and sound if we're not gonna keep focusing on why we want them in the first place. And that really is to help all our yeah. communities. And that really can important. be done and not can. at the expense of our that's economy right. Right. Yes. easily. Well, yeah. And that's why Johnson Crapo foundered, is people, mm -hmm. there was a strong sense on the Senate Banking Committee among some of the members that it didn't do enough, there wasn't enough public benefit. So I think that was, I, I, yeah, I, I think you're right that it's not a, 
that was not a wasted experience. That was a good, that's a good learning experience. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's, and you know, we are in a world where, um, you know, we have this big component of the housing market which has disappeared, which is the private label securitization piece. And a lot of the worst elements of the crisis ended up being securitized in that space. That's right. And um, it didn't, they didn't originate the mortgage, but they made the origination of bad mortgages possible and liquid. And so, and despite efforts in this administration, the previous one, to bring that back, it has not happened. And I think that's because the market has made a judgment that says, yeah, this is a bad idea. And instead, what you've seen is that PLS space, some of it has gone to FHA, some of it's stayed in the GSEs, but a lot of it has been in bank portfolios, which has been also, I think, healthy up to a certain point. And in a rising rate environment, we may have tapped that out. We may, having lived through the previous, previous, previous crisis, um, we may not want to have banks, you know, doubling down on their portfolios in a rising interest rate environment. And so where do we go from there? Linda? And then Jerron. That's my question for the lenders working here. You know, Congress doesn't, isn't known for swift action on big things, so gridlock probably isn't going to give us much that way. And if there is a regulatory strategy and we have a new administrator, sort of what next, right? Are we playing defense? Are we playing offense? Are we trying to get some special stuff carved out? For those of us who are sort of practical about all this, where would we play? I'm very interested in duty to serve in the NOAA space, for example, like what yep. might we do in this next one year period that would make this better for all of us uh, in whatever space we're working in? I would argue that the new director of FHFA is going to be the game changer for all of us, right? Because right. will we see legislation across the next year? Haven't seen it much in the other area. I mean, you know, it's tough with the new Congress, but you will have a director who will have extraordinary administrative authority. He does have a framework with duty to serve. He has an opportunity to go further with duty to serve. There are a number of things that Fannie and Freddie did historically that they could be doing today, working with HFAs, investing in uh, workforce equity that could be game changers for all of us and the people that we serve. Well, and, so there's, a, I, and there's a role oh, for, I was gonna say, and there's a role for NHC to help broker broad conversations with the housing industry, because the, you know, it's easier to do things administratively when you've got a strong sense of the industry of, yeah, that's a good idea. So I, I would, you know, encourage us to work together and not do the squabbling Hauser thing that we can all do so well. So we can, we can do the squabbling, but it has to be in our conference room with the door closed. Exactly. I think that in terms of my, my concern about the next director, um, without trying to be too partisan, um, my concerns would be an, a director appointed by this administration, um, increased uh, loan level price adjustments, increased guarantee pricing. Um, CRL already argues, and we have reports to back it up, uh, many of your orgs do as well, that uh, the, the risk-based pricing is already too excessive, um, overly excessive, like beyond the protecting the economy piece and that. And, you know, we've seen reports from Ur Urban Institute, CoreLogic, you know, six million uh, uh, potential uh, borrowers, you know, creditworthy borrowers are, are being shut out of the system during the excessive pricing. CoreLogic took some of those numbers, determined 250,000 of that number would have gone to borrowers of color. You know, there are a lot of issues now. I would be concerned about uh, a push to private, uh, an irrational and not planned push to privatization for this next, but I don't know that to be sure. I just said would be a concern. In terms of legislatively, I think I, I look at the areas, when the House flipped, I look at the areas where I've noticed industry and consumer civil rights come together a little bit more. I think mm -hmm. you get a little bit more. So in terms of what can be done, I think sm legislatively, if anything, smaller pieces. Uh, alternative credit scoring, I think, is something that I've seen. Representative Duffy, yeah. Republican, very conservative Republican on House Financial Services Committee member, he'll probably you know, be a ranking member of a subcommittee. For instance, I know that there's interest there. On FHA, that's another piece where I believe that there are uh, things already in place. Yep. Uh, the you know we already heard earlier on what is being done, and I think more money to that to that from Congress to HUD modernization of programs, modernization of defects, taxonomy. 
reforms to the False mm -hmm. Claim Act. These are these are areas where we actually come together with industry, and and the devil's always in the details. But I do think smaller pointed departmental type reforms can be possible if done right. I think that's a great point. We're going to go five minutes long. Um, Jaron had a question. Yes, and I then mean. We'll have time for one more. <laughs> You all have sort of tiptoed around it, I, I think, the more, more you talk. Um, I know that um, prior uh, conservators have thought it important in the wind down to, you know, shrink the dominant, quote unquote, shrink the dominant footprint of the GSEs, to shrink their role in the market uh, in anticipation of more private market players coming into uh, the market to play functions that they've played. Uh, and, and you mentioned, you know, you want the GSEs to be proactive. I personally think we are going into a regulatory, a new FHFA a director who will, you know, sort of shrink their role. There's a lot of conversation that they're taking too much risk. It's going to be a hearing. Uh, in about a week about that in, in, the pro in the things that they're doing. I guess I, my question to you is whether, you know, is there private, are there private market players who, will, who can come in and play a role uh, to address some of the ho housing challenges we have <laughs> if you shrink the GSEs, uh, higher capital requirements, lower loan limits, uh, reducing the products that they're putting into the market and so forth. I'll be self-serving and talk about multifamily. Um, Me too. Because there is uh, more competition uh, in the multifamily space than there certainly is in the single family space. Yeah. Um, but what it, they've played a counter-cyclical role historically. They're playing a bit of a pro-cyclical role right now. I think, they're, mm -hmm. I think the, F, the FHFA is concern about the market share that they've grown to and do what I think that they are um, pursuing some ways to constrain some of the uh, market share of the multifamilies today. There is a significant expansion. Um, there is a cap in place. There is a production cap, unlike single family. Um, hasn't been as effective because there are a lot of things that are outside of the cap. So they are, they are there, there is precedent on the multifamily side to try and actively manage and promote uh, more private lending. I know it's not the same in the single family space at all. Um, certainly would like to be able to promote that as well. I don't know if, the, if there's any similar analogies. I could put my single family hat on, but I'd probably get in trouble for doing that. So That's okay. And I'll jump in on the single family pieces. You know, I am now worried about irresponsible underwriting right now. We've learned that lesson. It may be a problem 10 years when everybody's forgotten. But we, we've learned that lesson about irresponsible underwriting, except that when you look at the cash out refinance numbers and how fast they're growing, 87% of the refinances today are taking more than 5% um, uh, 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 or actually increasing the loan amount more than 5%. That's a lot of equity coming out of the system. And, you know, if that's going into the house, that's fine. If that's paying for retirement or college, that makes sense that we do that with retirement plans too. But when that's just trying to fend off a recession because recession shouldn't happen anymore, um, it's incredibly dangerous because at the time when people need that money the most, um, it's not there. And I think we have to be really, really careful about that. Do you have other, other, any other questions before we wrap up? Any closing thoughts somebody want to jump in with? Carol? Maybe one good way to get uh, Congress would involved would be to have the best brains trying to simplify the messages. <laughs> and I can do geek stuff, you know, like everybody else, but I know just, just having read Tailspin by Stephen Brill, I, I, I was shocked the la second to last chapter was pro-affordable housing. But the, uh, he uh, details the complexities that uh, helped, I think, generate the problem. Is that on anybody's agenda? Uh, an, acronym, an acronym list. <laughs> I, I definitely think that's an important piece of it. And I also think that in, as we move into this next year, what we're seeing is as the affordability crisis has crept up the income scale, 
more and more people are hearing about it and talking about it, and members of Congress of both parties are hearing about it from their constituents. And I think we should at least uh, enter this period with an open mind to say, um, maybe people you're not necessarily thinking of as your traditional housing supporters, may, and this is gonna be important as people go up to the Hill tomorrow, uh, may in fact have more to say and he want to hear about in affordable housing. On that note, thank you all. Thank you everybody for being here and for participating.